just edit it. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Thank you so much. Bye. You're welcome. Good to be here. Yeah. Um, so maybe uh, I'd love to learn more about your research, what you've been doing. Sure. Sure. Most of our research today involves climate and health issues. I'm a bioclimatologist. And we got into this uh, when EPA had called up and asked us to develop heat health warning systems for many cities around the country. Uh, these health, heat health warning systems warn the National Weather Service when they should call excessive heat warnings. And they're in many of the major cities of the country right now. Mm -hmm. And that led us on this particular path. And before we knew it, we were doing this for the, with the National Weather Service and finally with health departments all around the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we have done stuff involving heat and human health, cold and human health, mm -hmm. and a variety of other issues as well. We've dealt with asthma issues, uh, we've dealt with pollution issues, um, we deal even with vector-borne disease spread, mm -hmm. uh, although that's not my particular specialty. And uh, right now the new in thing in all of this are cool city solutions. That is, we know the cities are hot, they're hotter than the suburban areas because of something called the urban heat island. But there are means of cooling the city down to a level where it's not comfortable, but where it's cool enough to save lives. Because heat is the major weather-related killer in America, bar none. It's worse than hurricanes, tornadoes, lightning, snow, blizzards, ice combined. It's the worst weather-related killer, and about 1,500 people a year die of heat-related causes. So, uh, What are the, some of the causes? Uh, well, mainly it's elderly people who are in homes that often are not air conditioned, poor elderly. Uh, they may live near the top stories of several story apartment buildings. You know, heat rises, plus you have the sun beating down on roofs, mm -hmm. and between the two, the top stories are often the most deadly. Mm -hmm. Most people don't even know that. Uh, in some cases, some of the elderly turn the heat on instead of the air conditioning. They don't, you know, they're not totally mm -hmm. aware. But it's not only them. Uh, there are a number of foolish younger individuals who think they're tough. It's amazing. Everyone thinks they're immune to this. Mm -hmm. And many of them die of heart attacks and strokes. They don't die, die of heat exhaustion or heat stroke, but they die either of respiratory distress, heart attack, or stroke. Mm -hmm. So this is really common in the United States, particularly in northern areas, mm -hmm. not in southern areas where it's hotter, but in areas like New York and Minneapolis and St. Louis and even mm -hmm. Los Angeles and Seattle. Mm -hmm. Because it is not the heat itself that's killing them, it's the fact that people are not adapted to the variability in the weather. So mm -hmm. take Miami, no one dies of the heat down here mm -hmm. because it's hot every single day. And we're all used to it. Air conditioning is ubiquitous. But if you go to Seattle and you get a 90 degree day, which is very, very rare, no one has air conditioning there. No one knows how to deal with the heat. And that's where you see a lot of deaths. Or in Philadelphia, which has the most row homes of any city in mm -hmm. America with black tar roofs. They're made out of red brick. They're literally brick ovens. And Philly is also one of those cities with a highly variable summer climate. And uh, do you see, when we talk about climate change and rising sea levels, um, has there been an increase? Because I talked with other researchers and they said there's an increase in, in sea levels and it's projected like a, feet and a half, foot and a half. So, um, well, sea level will have nothing to do with this particular this issue at all. Yeah, um, right. But there isn't necessarily an increase either because there's been an increase in awareness to all of this. I think climate change, rather than having caused the change in climate, has caused a change in awareness of people's perspective on the weather. And so what has happened over the last number of years is that there are more warnings out, people are much more aware that this is a problem, they know what to do during hot weather and so on. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, uh, climate change and the fact that the issue is in the forefront mm -hmm. has almost been a positive rather than a negative. Oh. Now, I don't know if it but, continues to get warmer as the models say, there's just so far this will go because you'll have a number of days that are above the threshold of human tolerance, and if that happens, then it'll become more of a negative. Mm -hmm. So, do you, when you talked about the, the heat-related deaths or something, is, has there been an increase? When, when I, I understand that the climate has been warming or the global weather, so has there been an increase in those like? Actually, no. For those reasons, we have not seen an increase because mm -hmm. of better warning systems. I mean, climate change can be a benefit because mm -hmm. it's in the news. 20 years ago, who talked about climate? Mm -hmm. I mean, there was no issue about climate change. It wasn't in the news. People were dying because they didn't even realize, you got a heart attack. People may not have even known what caused the heart attack at the time. Mm -hmm. What's happened in the last 20 years? Climate change is in the forefront. Mm -hmm. Everyone's talking about it getting warmer. 
There have been more resources put toward this, this cool cities initiative work. 20 years ago, no one would have been funding work like this. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, they are. And so, in an ironic way, climate change has actually, at least temporarily, mm -hmm. improved the situation because of the increased awareness. Now, if climate change does occur in the way the models say, mm -hmm. and the weather gets much, much hotter, there'll be a point where that benefit will turn into a negative because there'll be so many intolerable days that mm -hmm. more people will start dying again. But mm -hmm. we have not seen an increase in heat-related mortality. As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, we've seen a decrease in many cities because of the increased awareness. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it seems to be counterintuitive, oh, yeah. but if you understand the fact that it, climate change comes along with people knowing much more about how to deal mm -hmm. with the climate, because we never talked about it 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and now we are, stakeholders are, public servants are, and people are much more aware of what they should be doing. Right. And one researcher said there's an increase maybe in asthma related? because it's the Yeah, now there are some things like that yeah. that you cannot help. Uh, asthma is caused mainly by extreme changes in conditions. Mm -hmm. um, we found in our research, and this is particularly true, true of pediatric asthma, mm -hmm. that in many cities there is a huge peak in asthma in the fall. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't figure out why this is occurring. Uh, and sure enough, we made a hypothesis. You were talking about the, uh, you know, how to do the scientific method. Mm -hmm. um, we have a hypothesis now that is yet unproven. Mm -hmm. That hypothesis is that, especially because this was in northern cities, in cities like New York, mm -hmm. that in the fall, they turn all the heating systems on after there have been no use of them for the summer because mm -hmm. most air conditioners are window units mm -hmm. and all of the dust mites, roach droppings, and all the other things that create asthma problems are blown into rooms where people are mm -hmm. and that's when we see asthma increasing. Mm -hmm. So that is my hypothesis. Now what I would need is a mm -hmm. good graduate student maybe one sitting here, I don't know, but a good graduate <laughs> student to go probe this because it's a very interesting project. Uh -huh. But again, in the scientific method, you have a hypothesis based on what is intuitively correct. Yeah. But now you've got to understand whether or not this is the case, uh -huh. and we would then need to develop an experiment to yeah. determine whether this is really happening. So what I've given you is the hypothesis, and uh, we do see those increases in asthma. To be quite honest, I don't know how climate change is going to affect that. Um, I mean, it's still going to be cool and cold in the winter. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same thing that people say, well, if there's going to be warming temperatures, there may be more heat-related deaths, but less cold-related deaths. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work like that. It, it's not quite that simple. Mm -hmm. um, in asthma, in this case, it's still going to be cold enough in the winter where people have to turn on their heating systems, and all of that stuff is going to be blown into the room. Mm -hmm. With the heat and cold-related deaths, um, most of the cold-related deaths are not due to people getting frostbite or shoveling snow. I mean, literally every person who dies shoveling snow you read about, you know, and there's only a few of them. There aren't many of them. Not anything to the scale of heat-related deaths. What most people die of in the winter is from infectious diseases mm -hmm. because we are shoved indoors and people have the flu or whatever and they are transmitting it between each other. Now, let's assume the winter temperature is warm in New York from 32 to 36. Mm -hmm. Just give you an example. Are people suddenly going to be outdoors and not be indoors? They're still going to be confined indoors. Mm -hmm. So my theory or hypothesis on this is that although summer mortality may eventually start going up, winter mortality won't because mm -hmm. people will still be indoors transmitting infectious diseases at the same rate. You're still going to be inside in January, February, March because of this in those northern cities. Mm -hmm. So these, these subjects are all more complicated than they mm -hmm. seem. Oh, it's going to get hotter, there are going to be more deaths. But, yeah. you know, it really doesn't, you've got to put the whole picture and the whole puzzle together, you know. How can people adapt to it? I mean, I know a little bit about some breathing techniques where people can learn how to adapt better with their, um, with like an, I don't know, how to say, increased connection with their nervous, uh, like the immune system or something, and it, they're kind of like holistic practices coming from Tibet or something, so I'm not sure how, how applicable that is. But so. Well, well, if we talk about the issue of extreme temperatures mm -hmm. on human health, uh, I think that people adapt in a different manner than that. 
I think mainly we will adapt by changing the physical structure that we live in. Mm -hmm. And this is where, again, these cool city solutions come in. If you plant more vegetation in urban areas, if you put mm -hmm. reflective materials on the roofs, if you put films on the windows that reflect solar radiation outward, mm -hmm. and you use less air conditioning because of this, if you in increase the reflectivity of pavement, all of those things mm -hmm. can help improve the situation. So really, quite honestly, I'm hopeful, mm -hmm. rather than pessimistic, that we will be able to turn this thing around. Um, presently, I'm under contract with the 3M Corporation mm -hmm. that makes many of these things. Mm -hmm. Last May, they flew down to Miami, right here, and we had a long chat about how we could model how their products can improve the climate in the city. Mm -hmm. And so what we have found out that if suddenly uh, these products they put on the roofs increase the reflectivity four times. If we, and let's say 25% of the urban area is roof. Mm -hmm. If we started using these in a widespread fashion, we're not gonna cool the city by 10 degrees, mm -hmm. but if you cool them by two to three degrees, that's mm -hmm. gonna be enough to save lives because many people will now not be at their threshold mm -hmm. of having a, a death experience. Mm -hmm. They will be below the threshold. And so, I think that's the adaptation we're going to have. It's going to be a physical, mm -hmm. urban structural adaptation. And then, of course, there is the part of humans becoming more aware of the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we're going to adapt physically, like breathing differently, or I, I, our blood's going to get thinner, or I, I don't believe that's going to be the form of adaptation we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Not one where you and I are suddenly different. We do adapt to our climatic conditions. I mean, there's no doubt about it. If suddenly all of us had to move to Boston mm -hmm. and deal with cold winters, the first few winters would be horrible, but eventually you get used to it, you know, and we do adapt. But I think that adapt is that adaptation is behavioral and mental, mm -hmm. not physical. Mm -hmm. Long answer, I'm sorry. No, no, that's beautiful. Because okay. I'm such a, like, I'm, I, I, I hear you on that and, and I love that vision and I think it's very applicable yeah and on the other end I just like know so much about simple breathing techniques where people can learn how to warm up their body temperature it's called like inner fire or something and then see like, I, I know absolutely nothing about that to be honest <laughs> with you but I I do think that, that if, if these are kind of things that may become more prevalent uh, even if the earth gets warmer I mean people people have a great resilience in terms of adaptation mm -hmm. the big worry is that if things get so bad that we are above tolerance range. I mean, mm -hmm. if you live in Phoenix, Phoenix has been warming steadily, mm -hmm. not due to the kind of global warming that we're talking about, mm -hmm. but because Phoenix in 1950 had 90,000 people. Mm -hmm. Now it has two million, three million. So what happens is that the whole structure of Phoenix has changed mm -hmm. and the temperatures have gone up because there's been a huge urban heat island that's been created. Mm -hmm. uh, also, there's no water there and people are irrigating their lawns. So mm -hmm. now what happens is that the humidity mm -hmm. has gone up along with the temperature oh. and it's created a much worse environment. This isn't the kind of climate change that you and I are talking about where mm -hmm. we're emitting trace gases into the atmosphere mm -hmm. and the whole world is going to get warmer. These are urban issues. Mm -hmm. And so Phoenix is a great study, and Las Vegas, same mm -hmm. thing, a great study of how a city has become much, much warmer mm -hmm. over the last few years, mm -hmm. especially the minimum temperatures, not so much the maximums, mm -hmm. but the overnight temperatures have gone up because humid air has a higher specific heat than dry air. It holds moisture better. It's like the ocean. At mm -hmm. night, the ocean doesn't get very cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go in the ocean at night, it's the same temperature as it is during the day. Mm -hmm. Water has the highest specific heat. It doesn't mm -hmm. change and respond. Air has a lower specific heat. Mm -hmm. Sun goes down, the air cools, especially mm -hmm. dry air. Mm -hmm. If you make that air more humid, mm -hmm. it's not gonna cool as much, mm -hmm. so. And regarding public health, like, is there gonna be, sometimes I read about water scarcity projected or something? I mean, those are all possibilities. Again, we're leaving the realm of my comfort area, okay. but but clearly there already are water shortages. I mean, um, many of these cities have their water transported in from thousands of miles, not thousands, hundreds of miles. I mean, if you live in Los Angeles mm -hmm. that has grown and is so large, their water comes from the Sierras, mm -hmm. three, four hundred miles away and is carried down by a number, series of aqueducts mm -hmm. to go into Los Angeles because their summer's totally dry. Mm -hmm. uh, there is almost no rain in Los Angeles between about May and October. Mm -hmm. That's why all those fires are up in October. 
well, you have a growing phenomena, a growing city, mm -hmm. it's going to create a problem. Phoenix, the same thing. Mm -hmm. The water has to be imported mm -hmm. from the mountains. There's mm -hmm. not enough there. Hmm. And what are, what are the main um, problems here in Miami, in Florida? Was that like maybe an increase in asthma? Was, was assumed yeah, I would say that maybe asthma, uh, heat-related mortality is just not a problem in this city. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't even develop a heat warning system for Miami mm -hmm. or Tampa or Key West, which are the three most southern mm -hmm. weather stations in, in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, it, when you have a consistently warm climate, mm -hmm. people are very well adapted, even construction work. Mm -hmm. uh, even people who work on your lawn, I always marvel at the fact that they all wear long sleeves. That my first observation, our lawns people at our house on Marco Island wear long sleeves mm -hmm. and they wear a long wide brimmed hat and the hat goes over their neck. Mm -hmm. And all of this of course seems like it would make you warmer, but it keeps you from really getting killed by the sun's rays because mm -hmm. it, at our latitude, this time of year, the sun is directly overhead. You cast mm -hmm. only a shadow at your feet. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this is a tropical place. Mm -hmm. And we have adapted to that. People who work here have adapted to that. The urban structure is not like the Northeastern United States. They're not brick townhomes here with black mm -hmm. tar roofs. None of those things are happening here. Mm -hmm. So Miami is relatively immune mm -hmm. to this particular problem. Now, if it gets warmer, um, I think that because of the high specific heat and the humidity here, it's going to get warmer less mm -hmm. than it would get warmer up in northern environments. As a matter of fact, climate change is proceeding at a faster pace mm -hmm. north than it is to the south. It's fastest in the Arctic, by the way. The further north you go, mm -hmm. the pace of climate change is faster. So uh, you go further into the tropics, it's slower. Well, what, what does it have to do with? That? Well, it has to do again with the fact that here you've reached a kind of a level because the air is saturated with moisture. It's very mm -hmm. hard to warm it up, mm -hmm. uh, even if you put trace gases into it. In the Arctic, you have a totally different story. Actually, the greatest warming has been in the winter in those places where maybe instead of mm -hmm. minus 50, it's minus 40. Mm -hmm. Now you might say, well, that's no big deal, but that's a 10 degree difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, if our temperatures went up 10 degrees and suddenly it was 100 degrees every day in Miami instead mm -hmm. of 90, we'd have a real problem, mm -hmm. but that's not what's happening. Mm -hmm. wow. And how do, um, do you, from your personal perspective, did you, regarding rising sea levels or climate change, um, how, what, did you, what have you experienced the last 20, 30 years? Do you, did you feel any like effects? With I feel no effects. Um, that doesn't mean it isn't happening. Um, I'll be quite honest with you. I am not 100% certain. The climate is warming, mm -hmm. okay? There is no doubt. Anyone who says that it isn't is not being honest to themselves. The climate is warming. That's not the big question in climate change. The question is why. One possibility is anthropogenic climate change, that these gases we're putting in the atmosphere is making it warmer. Another is that we're just in the midst of a natural cycle, a natural warming cycle. I don't think anyone can tell you with 100% certainty which one of these is happening, or if they're not happening in concert, and if they are happening in concert, is the human part 90% and the natural 10? Mm. Is the natural part 90 and the human part 10? Or is it 100 to zero, mm. either way? No one knows. It is warming. Mm. Now, my approach has always been that there is a chance it's due to humans, mm -hmm. and because of that, we need to take special measures to mm. make certain that we can curb whatever contributions humans are adding to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I just read today that Trump is thinking of pulling out of the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. um, you know what? doesn't bother me because I don't think the Paris Agreement is worth almost anything. Mm -hmm. China and India are not signatories to the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. And so they are the two fastest growing emitters. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. had a separate deal with China mm -hmm. that they made under the Obama administration where China has to stabilize by 2030. Mm -hmm. That's still 13 years away. So between now and 13 years, China can do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's all the bounds they have right now. And already China is way ahead of the US in, in emissions, mm -hmm. not per capita because they have over a billion people, but in total emissions. So I think we need a better plan mm -hmm. to deal with climate change. I'm not smart enough to tell you what the plan is. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I do think we need to come up 
with a belief that humans are a major contributor mm -hmm. and work something out better than the Paris Agreement. Europe has always been quite good in terms of conservation. Mm -hmm. um, their emissions have actually gone down in some cases, but it's easier in Europe. Uh, there's smaller cars, there's much better public transportation. The U.S. would have to invest trillions, literally, uh, into public transportation to equal Europe. And then, would you get people to go along with it? Would you get all these people in Los Angeles who commute an hour and a half every day mm -hmm. to say, you know what, I'm going to take the bus to work mm -hmm. or the train? Uh, train service is much worse here than in Germany and Switzerland or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, again, I think it's a very complicated issue in terms of how we'll deal with this. Mm -hmm. And what are like, like resources or tips you could give for people to look up, to inform themselves about their own health and then also regarding climate? Yeah, I, I think that climate and health is a growing issue. I think it's now being recognized in the public health community for the first mm -hmm. time. That's why suddenly graduate students are popping up. Mm -hmm. uh, Megan here would be my, th if she works with me, would be my third public health graduate student. Before this, I had zero for all of my career. My colleagues in bioclimatology and climate and health had zero, none. It is just now that the public health community has really latched onto this. And, you know, me being here in a public health unit, I'm the only climatologist as I know it mm -hmm. in the United States that's in a public health unit. Now, I may be, there may be one other somewhere or two others, but as far as I know, I am the only one. So what has to happen is that the public health community has to team with the climate community to mm -hmm. work this problem out. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not a public health guy. I was not trained in the medical field. I've never taken one formal medical course. Mm -hmm. Most public health people are not trained in the climate field. Mm -hmm. They've not taken one formal climate course. Mm -hmm. So the fact is that the two need to get together. I've learned a lot only through osmosis working in the climate and health field. That's the only way a guy like me can do, do this. If I'm in my 50s, I'm not taking a course in public health. Mm -hmm. So having been around with more cooperation right here in this department too with colleagues in public health has been very, very useful to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about the fact that toward the tail end of my career here, suddenly we see students very interested in this. We see faculty very interested in this. Mm -hmm. We even have a, a possibility of having some kind of climate change uh, master's degree mm -hmm. right here in this particular department. That was unheard of. Mm -hmm. even 10 years ago. So this is the way I, I think we need to answer the question that we in the public health community, the climatologists mm -hmm. and the public health people have to work together and that's why I'm excited about new graduate students and the fact that the faculty has become mm -hmm. aware of this issue. Also interdisciplinary like communication and collaboration. You know what it's like. Uh, normally the two groups go to their own meetings. So mm -hmm. I go to all the climate professional meetings. Mm -hmm. The public health people go to all the public health professional meetings. Mm -hmm. They don't meet. Mm -hmm. There is now a International Society of Biometeorology, mm -hmm. which I think has been very useful in bringing this together because mm -hmm. now the World Health Organization and the World Meteorological Organization mm -hmm. are working together on this. I'm on a lot of commissions for the World Meteorological Organization. Mm -hmm. And now, for the first time, this is happening. The public health people have generally worked in their own sphere and so have the climatologists. So your point about interdisciplinary work is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And Nona, thank you so much. So oh, what exciting, exciting to hear. Yeah, it? yeah, I'm and excited. What, um, and on a personal level, if somebody listens to this, what, can, what do you recommend of like informing themselves? Like, um, yeah, um, I, I, I just think that it is important to know that weather is a big driver when it comes to health. Mm -hmm. um, it affects our moods, we know that. It affects the air quality. Mm -hmm. It affects our ability to be able to concentrate. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many things that it does. And it also affects our physical health and well-being. Mm -hmm. If you are under conditions that you are not used to, stressful conditions, mm -hmm. and what that means is if suddenly we were moved to Duluth, Minnesota in the winter, or Duluth, Minnesota people were moved to Miami in the summer, people need to be able to adapt. We do, mm -hmm. but it takes a while. So if we're exposed to those kinds of conditions, a lot of the people who die of these heat-related causes and other problems are travelers who just mm -hmm. have never experienced this before. Imagine if you've never been to Phoenix before. Mm -hmm. You live in Boston. You've never been to Phoenix before, and it's 115 degrees out. Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, it's a dry heat. Forget it's a dry heat. Mm -hmm. My son went to school at Arizona State. 
it is incredibly uncomfortable mm -hmm. to people who have lived all their lives even in a humid climate. Even Miami people would find Phoenix stiflingly bad mm -hmm. because we're used to hot, humid conditions, and they would find us to be stiflingly bad. Mm -hmm. So the point is that all organisms mm -hmm. adapt. Um, I'll just give you one little background story. Mm -hmm. When I started my PhD, mm -hmm. I got a grant from the Forest Service to work on a little insect mm -hmm. called the Southern Pine Beetle. Mm -hmm. It's an insect the size of a dot mm -hmm. on a piece of paper, but it causes, bill it causes billions of dot dollars of damage to mm -hmm. trees all around the United States mm -hmm. because it bores into the trees and it breaks off the circulation. You know, there's the phloem and xylem and the mm -hmm. trees that bring moisture down between the roots and the this is how I started mm -hmm. my professional climate career. And what I found out was that we had two study plots, one in Texas where it was pretty dry, mm -hmm. and one in Louisiana, I went to LSU, mm -hmm. where it was pretty moist. Well, the trees in Louisiana were affected by the southern pine beetle during drought. The trees in Texas were affected by the southern pine beetle during periods of moisture. Mm -hmm. That is because the Louisiana trees were used to the moisture but when drought occurred, they were weakened and the beetles were able to drill their way into the tree and kill them. In Texas, well, they were used to the drought. When it was wet and trees were in standing water, that weakened them. So even trees react like people. They react badly to the thing that is unusual. And it was the same species of tree and the same species of insect. Things that are not, you don't, insects and trees don't think like people do, and yet they responded just like people. Mm -hmm. And that's what got me on this path in the first place, by working with that lowly little insect mm -hmm. and those forest trees in mm -hmm. Louisiana and Texas, so. Powerful insects. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, literally, it got me on my way, and I, I have a manuscript out there, it was maybe my first peer-reviewed manuscript, mm -hmm. that, in a, in a journal called Forest Science, I knew nothing about climate and health back then. You know, mm -hmm. I was not doing anything about this, but it was so clear that the trees reacted totally differently to the insects mm -hmm. in the two different environments. Same species of tree. Mm -hmm. And it was clear that it was the unusual climate event mm -hmm. that created the issue. Mm -hmm. even, even if it was very wet in Louisiana, mm -hmm. everything was fine. Even mm -hmm. if it was very dry in Texas, everything was fine. Mm -hmm. It's when it got wet in Texas and dry in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. and the problems erupted, so. And like what kind of websites or organizations or research can you, when people can look it up when they listen to this? Yes, like any um, uh, there's a lot of good websites on EPA, uh, the EPA mm -hmm. website on heat and health, mm -hmm. and there are millions of things. We actually have published a monograph on uh, dealing with the heat on the EPA website, mm -hmm. and so if you Googled either my name or heat and health, mm -hmm. uh, you will find it. Uh, I think EPA is a very good site and a very good storehouse for, for things like this. And also, go to the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization, or World Health Organization sites. There are big monographs there uh, that you can read as well. And even the National Weather Service sites, almost every major city in the Northeast or Far West has a part where it talks about dealing with extreme weather mm -hmm. and how you should deal with it in terms of health problems. Mm -hmm. So there are many, many places. And in some cases, health, uh, public health departments are very aware. Mm -hmm. We've worked very close with the Polk County Public Health Department mm -hmm. in Des Moines, Iowa, mm -hmm. who would think that they would be so aware, but they have a city that's very vulnerable to heat. And we've worked mm -hmm. with them for years. They have a very good website uh, in mm -hmm. terms of heat and health. So mm -hmm. there are many right. places. Google heat and health or how to cope with heat and health, and you will find tons of things. And here in Miami, locally, are there any places where people can go, like communities or centers? Or? Well, not being, again, the problem is I'm in Miami in a place where this is not a major problem uh, in itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but of course, there are other health problems, but you need to talk to other special, I mean Zika, uh -huh. for example, has a much larger potential to create a problem here. You need to talk to Dr. Beyer, of our department, who's the vector-borne disease specialist and mm -hmm. deals with the transmission of the disease by uh, different mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the things we need to be aware about here. Mm -hmm. Not only that, Miami is a hopping off point from people all over the world, especially from Latin America and the mm -hmm. tropics, much more so than the Northeast. They bring with them many unusual things from their particular locales mm -hmm. that can be introduced to Miami. But again, I'm not a specialist mm -hmm. uh, in, in dealing with this, so I'm not, you, you need to interview someone else yeah, to yeah. really get into that. So, sorry. No, 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 that's it.
Um, yeah, and uh, so yeah, that's it. thank you so much. Great. Any any other tips you have? Any what comes to mind regarding climate change? Or um, I I think the best tip is to avoid listening to the far skeptics and the far advocates, mm -hmm. the political. Don't listen to political people talking <laughs> about climate change because on both sides of the spectrum, uh -huh. they are literally extremists. And the people, I mean, mm -hmm. what do Trump and Obama know about climate change? Just mm -hmm. to take two on different sides. They mm -hmm. don't know anything. They've not been trained in climate change. All they have are their advisors. Mm -hmm. So who do Trump and Obama pick as their advisors on climate change? They pick people who support their particular stands on climate change. Mm -hmm. And so basically avoid all the political people when it mm -hmm. comes to climate change. And if you really want to learn about it, go onto a website that's uh, maybe like an EPA website, mm -hmm. uh, a website that does not have a vested interest. Mm -hmm. I would even avoid some of the nonprofit websites like uh, uh, NRDC and Sierra Club because they do have biased aspects, mm -hmm. or even those on the right that have biased aspects too. There are very good agencies, maybe statewide agencies, like this Polk County agency. They mm -hmm. have no ax to grind with climate change. Mm -hmm. And you could learn a lot by going to the more local levels mm -hmm. and not to people who are in it uh, to advance their own agenda. Mm -hmm. So uh, avoid Obama's website and Trump's website <laughs> when it comes to climate change because you're only going to get yeah. people who, they have people who advise them who are uh, yeah. just specifically in their agenda sphere. And regarding the EPA, are they getting less funding now? Uh, yeah, EPA has been cut back, yeah. uh, and climate change work has been cut back as well. Mm -hmm. But one thing that no administration can do mm -hmm. is to fire everyone at EPA who works on climate change. What they can fire is the administrator, and mm -hmm. that's what Trump has done. So they have this new fellow, Pruitt, mm -hmm. who's a climate change skeptic. But even Pruitt, who heads the EPA, cannot change the dynamics of all the workers at the EPA. Mm -hmm. He just can't do it because those workers have been entrenched there for 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. So they will always produce good stuff. And I'll go even further. The difference between the Democrats and the Republicans on climate change is not so much that one's a skeptic and one's an advocate. It's that one group is convinced that we are going to have a catastrophic outlook in mm -hmm. terms of climate change. The Democrats. Mm -hmm. And one is not even convinced yet that climate change is caused by people, mm -hmm. the Republicans. So when the Republicans are in power, there's usually more research on trying to prove that climate change is anthropogenic. When the Democrats are in power, well, they already believe that climate change is anthropogenic, so all their work is on policy development. Mm -hmm. That is, they're trying to develop policies to combat climate change. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if one group is ignoring it and the other group is doing it. Mm -hmm. It's that one group is looking to see if it's real. They're very skeptical. Mm -hmm. And one group is convinced that it's happening and they're developing policies. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, that's the way I look mm -hmm. at the difference between Democrats and Republicans. And there are crazies on both sides that, mm -hmm. I mean, there are crazies who think that on the Republican side that climate change is all a plot to take our money and for the government to control mm -hmm. our well-being. You're always going to have those. Mm -hmm. And there are those on the Democratic side who think that all the oil companies only want to make more and more money and they don't care how much they pollute and they're all being selfish and so on. Mm -hmm. Avoid those. Mm -hmm. Go look beyond the extremists when it comes to this issue. Mm -hmm. Self-informed. Uh, yeah, it's maybe. easy to get self-informed. You've got a web here that literally, you, you could look anything up, as mm -hmm. you well know, and you can find information on it. You have to be the filter, though, mm -hmm. and you have to determine what is telling you accurate information, and mm -hmm. uh, it's not an easy thing to do, especially mm -hmm. if you're a lay person. Mm -hmm. I, I'll give you an example. All of the people on Marco Island, a large variety of conservative Republicans, mm -hmm. where I live, they say, you're crazy. What are you working? You know this is all phony baloney. What are you working mm -hmm. on this stuff for? They think I'm some left-wing extremist mm -hmm. because I'm working on climate change. I say to them, what do you know about climate change? What you read, the things that support your viewpoint, and that's what you know. And I try to get them to go to the websites that mm -hmm. I consider to be much more accurate in terms of the climate change issue. Mm -hmm. 
I had a big fight recently with someone on the left who doesn't think I'm doing enough. They think, you know, you're a pawn of the right wing. You're not doing enough on climate change. I, it happens all the time. As soon as someone hears you're into this issue, which by the way is one of the reasons I like Cool City Solutions, because I don't have to argue anymore about climate change. Instead, we work on a real problem that's happening right now. Oh. Heat is already killing more people than any other weather-related cause. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter whether it's climate change or not. We should be going ahead with these cool city solutions. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, and basically, I do very little climate change work now, and mm -hmm. I'm much more into understanding climate and health and less about arguing mm -hmm. with the extremists on climate change. Mm -hmm. And certainly they don't go to the same conferences, mm -hmm. the anti and the pro people. So they get their, it's called confirmation mm -hmm. bias, as I think is the term, and it just gets worse and worse. And regarding cool cities, it sounds so interesting. What, is there any sources like you, to look up besides the ones you mentioned earlier? Yes, um, uh, I, I can't cite the websites right now. But what I would do is look at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory website. Mm -hmm. They're doing a lot of good work on trying to develop cool city solutions and, and using the materials that companies like 3M make mm -hmm. to try to cool the cities up. You can look at my own website. If you just type in my name, it's a Synoptic Climatology Lab. We have several articles mm -hmm. on work that we've done. There's a group called the Global Cool Cities Alliance, mm -hmm. which has supported, it's a nonprofit that has supported a lot of the work that we're doing as well. Mm -hmm. They're stationed in Washington, D.C. And they, of course, are strong advocates of this. There's the Cool Roof Rating Council, mm -hmm. a group that is only into, and I'm gonna be keynoting at their conference in just three weeks right. in Las Vegas. Uh, they deal with just the roofing aspects, the roofing projects. Mm -hmm. Look up reflective films. Uh, you could see what, again, they have films you could put on these windows that not a bit of the sun, that you could look out, but not a bit of the solar radiation is going to get inside. The reflectivity is 100%. It's a product that 3M makes. Mm -hmm. You could look up the products themselves. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of good websites to look at for this. Nice. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>